First of all, let me thank the organizers, in particular Ramon and Pastor and so on, for inviting me to share some points of view, some experiences on uh, plant-wide control or optimization of process plant in general. Um, what I'm going to, uh, to present is first a bit of history eh, and to see where we are now regarding the problem of optimal plant operation, optimal factory operation and so on. And I will highlight the current situation and, and the challenges we have, the research topics, and then I will present an industrial case study and some conclusions on that. Eh. Well, plant operation is not easy at all. And this is not only because of the complexity of the processes and so on, but because you have to uh, manage so that uh, the plant adapt uh, to the different uh, situations of the environment. And this includes the markets and the products you uh, receive, uh, the supply chains and so on. And you have to operate, of course, maximizing profits and minimizing the use of resources and many other things and so on. And if we see how plants have been operated over time, the first big step forward was the introduction of automation. Automation in general, I mean the distributed control systems and so on, which allow to increase the amount of information available and mainly to stabilize the operation of the plants. And with the use of the DCS, the control structures improve a lot. It was possible to to implement cascade, feed forward, many other uh, control structures that improve the operation and stabilize uh, the, the plants and so The second step forward was given by the introduction of MPC. Uh, all of you know which are the fundamentals of uh, MPC. So they have a model in which you predict the future behavior and you can include there the interactions between the different variables. You can uh, also consider explicitly constraints on the manipulated and the controlled variables and so on. So the quality of control clearly improved a lot in the sense that you were able to control the operation of a whole process unit. I mean a distillation column, a reactor and so on, referring to the process industry and so on, but to many other uh, type of processes and so on. But clearly the main interest in industry for MPC is not only the fact that you can operate, let's say, more or less comfortably. The operators appreciate a lot the fact that they don't have to worry continuously about the uh, constraints and uh, of many other points. But the, the main point with MPC, the success, came because of the well-known fact that when you improve control, you open the door for uh, improving the economics behavior or the economic benefit of the plant. And this picture is very well known that you have to operate with some constraints and you have a lot of variability. If you reduce the variability, so if you improve the control, then you can move the operating point, the set point, to another value. And maybe this value is more valuable. It's more valuable. And so this is a very simple example. And so Pastora has remember this because it corresponds to a pulp dryer in the sewer industry, so in which you have some humid pulp that uh, is being dried in a dryer, and for that you burn natural gas, so, and so, on. so you have a, a stream of hot gases that dry the pulp. And, so on. and of course, the humidity is distributed according to a certain distribution, and so on, and you cannot uh, be above a certain value if you wish to maintain the quality of the product. Eh? If you are able to reduce the, the spread, eh? you reduce the variance of, uh, of the humidity, you can move to a, a point which is closer to the constraints. Eh? That means that uh, you have more water within pulps, eh? and if you, the, in average, you don't have to evaporate so much water, you need less gas, and at the same time, you increase the amount of uh, pulp that is going to be sold to the farmers and so on. So it's, there is a clear link between moving the operating point 
and improving the process. And this is the, the key of the success, eh? to move from the region where the operators normally are to one point which is the, the optimum, eh? which is closer to the, to the, uh, to the um, uh, optimum, the economical optimum, and so on. Okay. So, after you have good control, after you have implemented MPC, the next logical step has been to put this layer that computes which are the optimum set points, eh? and so you can give to the MPC the set points about which is the best uh, operating point of, of a uh, certain process. And this is how the, uh, most of the commercial MPCs are now in operation. There are thousands of uh, implementations in which you can see that uh, what is sold as MPC is not only MPC, but MPC plus some, let's uh, call, uh, optimization layer, normally using the same linear model as the MPC. So and this is normally linear programming and so on, that computes the set points at the end of the uh, of the horizon, of the prediction horizon, eh, both in the manipulated and the, in the set points, eh, and this is how it operates normally. Eh. This simplifies a lot the implementation because you, the, the modeling effort is uh, the most important one. You have to, to spend uh, maybe 80% of the time in the implementation just uh, modeling the plant. Eh. So if, if you are able to reduce the modeling time, that's perfect for the implementation and so on. Okay. But this has some drawbacks. Huh? So this improves a lot a process, but you have to consider that uh, when you are the boss in a factory, what is important for you is not that that specific unit or that specific part of the plant huh, is uh, doing very well. What you wish is to have a global optimum, eh? a global benefit, and, and so on. So it may be, and quite often it happens, that what is good for one part of the process is not good for the whole operation. Eh? So you wish to introduce optimal operation into the, the into production, you have to consider the whole set of uh, plants, of elements, so to, have a, to increase the scope from a process unit to a whole plant. And from that point of view, linear models, even in a single plant, are good if you don't move far away from the linearization point. If you move to other points, then the quality of these models degrade. Well, finally, I was going to say that the conclusion is that you have to use nonlinear models if you wish to consider uh, more, a wider range of operating points and a certain number for, uh, on in, and a wider scope for, for operation and so on. But uh, I also have to, to comment that uh, if you increase the amount of, of your problems, then you need to use uh, simplified model. And in fact, in the economic layer, what you have normally is linear programming, linear models and so on. And one of the problems is, uh, which are currently on the table, are uh, how to uh, integrate the economic planning, which is made with simple linear models, which this more operational layer, which, is, uh, um, which uses nonlinear models and so on. Okay. But clearly, the problems, when you, you uh, present problems at this, with this uh, scope of the whole, set of units so of in a plant, or at least a big part of, of the plant, then uh, they have an enormous impact on the economy and efficiency of the whole plant, and they are the ones in which the managers of the plants are interested in, because it's the, they are the ones in which the most of the money comes from. And, so on. and normally they are formulated as uh, non-linear programming problems when you can, here I put X, normally you have also some integer variables, but problems that you have are of this type and, and so on. And there are a, a variety, an enormous variety of problems, very interesting ones, 
like for instance the use of shared resources. Eh? You have a plant that generates uh, steam and electricity and so on and you have to distribute the, uh, both the electrical energy and the steam and you consume more one point, you are going to consume less in another. The, according to the point in which you operate, you have differences, different efficiencies and so on. Or you can have, for instance, bottlenecks and you wish to, op to avoid eh, these uh, bottlenecks in sub points because you wish to increase production. So you have, you can, you have different paths for production and you have to manage at that time, but you can have problems of optimal energy use. For instance, a very interesting problem today is how to manage simultaneously the uh, production and energy according to the, for instance, the electricity prices, changes over uh, the day. And so on. so you, you can plan your production in order to operate in, in, at those uh, times in which the price of the electricity and so on is uh, cheaper and things like that. Or I put more things here, uh, integration with the production scheduling and so on. But in all these cases, what you need is a good model uh, in order to make decisions because there are a lot of interrelations. You need good models. So modeling and simulation is a key topic. And then, of course, you have, you have to link which is the operation in the control room, which is mainly MPC and control structures, DCS and so on, with the decisions you take at the level of, of the plant, which are linked to RTO and so on. Okay. One important point here is that uh, we mentioned the models are key eh, for that. But uh, there is no good models. You never have good models. Eh? And there is, in one physical model, there are lots, for instance, of unknown parameters. Eh? Uh, many of the variables that appear in the models, here X represent any variable, eh? not, not only states or things like that, any variables. Eh? Many of these variables are unknown. For instance, composition. In our refinery, when you are processing changes every two or three days, sometimes you get crude from Nigeria, sometimes from uh, Saudi Arabia and so on, so, and no one analyzed that. So you don't know what is what comes into your model, so you, you need to estimate things, and there are many parameters and so on that are unknown. So the first step for using or for optimizing is to perform what is called data reconciliation. And of course, eh, there are many variables in which you have a meter here that the measure 150 cubic meters per hour, and you have in the same pipe another meter that is measuring 160. And which one is the good, the good one? You don't know. So you have to recon reconcile measurements and their reality, and you have to estimate more parameters. So normally, in order to implement RTO, you need to put a layer in which using redundancy in measurement, and this is key, your model has to be um, le let's say a, a structure such that you have more measurements than unknowns. Eh? Taking into account the number of equations, number of variables, you need more measurements. Redundant information so that you can estimate things. Eh? And if not, change your model. Your model eh? but, or put more measurements. But if you don't do this, it's very difficult to have something that can fit the reality. So the data reconciliation problem basically is to estimate parameters and variables of your model. Eh? So the, your variables and parameters has to satisfy the equations such that the measurements are as close as possible to the values that fit your equations. Eh? Basically, this is a large, of course, with a set of constraints, this is a large optimization problem but can be solved and so on. Eh? Normally, this problem is accompanied by other things. These other things are that if you include measurements in your problem, here you have measurements, and if some of them are affected by gross bias, drifts, things like that, they are clearly large, then they will ask you try to adjust your model to the measurements. One single very bad variable can move the other variables away from the, from the variables. So you, in a certain way, you have to detect and remove these values. So you need here, and of course, 
there are many outliers and things that are required. So before data reconciliation, you you should yeah, put some uh, layer of uh, data treatment and maybe gross error detection. And so on. I will comment this later on slightly. And normally at this level, what you wish is to find which is the best, let's say, steady state operating point and so on. So you ask, your models normally are steady state models. So what you put here should be in steady state. Your measurements should be in steady state. So uh, you should include the steady state. I mentioned, or I said you should, because if you go to the uh, reality, what is in operation in plants, and there are studies about that. Roughly 95% uh, of the times you are not in a steady state. Eh? So the options are you switch off your system <laughs> most of the times, eh? or you just <laughs> made some uh, forget about that. Eh? One good solution is to use average data over a certain period of time, which eh? you can or to put some special provisions and, and so on. But in practice, this is normally off. Mm? And you implement some other tricks in order to, because it's very rare that if you take the scope of a, of a plant or a whole plant and so on, everything is going to be in a steady state. Okay, so this is what you implement normally, RTO and RTO in theory set the set points of different MPCs for different parts of them, or di directly goes to the basic control. And so we will discuss this eh, later on. Of course, the, your RTO depends on the planning of the factory. And you are in, just interacting at this level a lot. And, so on. and in order to know how would, uh, you are operating or not, you, has also, you, you should take advantage of the fact that you have good information about the plan here. So normally you compute some KPIs and key performance indicators or resource efficiency indicators that gives you an idea the how the plant is going. And, so and the purpose of the RTO is to maintain good values in these indicators, global indicators of the plant. And, so and this fits more or less into this uh, typical mm, pyramid of control structure and so on. This is the, let's say, the functional view. This is the, how it's implemented and so on. The, the other day I saw a very nice presentation of this in which uh, uh, this is very well structured. This is hierarchical control. But if you go inside these things, there are so many things today here for maintenance, for uh, I don't know, scheduling, for many, other, many, many things, and, and so on, that this is not, uh, this is really a mess. So, to uh, the amount of uh, software that is at this level and so on is enormous today. Uh, it's, a, it's a complexity. Everything is interacting with this. So, this uh, more and more, this tends to be nothing organized, but a real network of software uh, connected to one point and another, and so on. And now let me, uh, this is how things are in the books and more or less up to now. Eh? Now let me tell three points in which I think that the research is focused and the practice is focused. Eh? The first point is the fact that up to now RTO has been presented as uh, a static problem and so on. And certainly is maybe the most practical way of approaching the problem. Eh? And you look for the steady state of the process. Of the, but there are, on one hand, you have many problems in which you cannot uh, consider steady state. You take, for instance, the distribution of gas. Eh? And when you, you wish to, you have some uh, plants or some uh, pipelines uh, from the south or here in some points, there are the gasifiers and you wish to distribute to your clients the gas and so on. This takes time. Right? Maybe there are hundreds of kilometers from the origins to the, so from the sources 
to the consumers, and, so, and there's delays and so on. So your model has to include, eh? your operation has to include delays and time and so on. Mm? All the times when you are operating with batch processes, there is no steady state and, and so on. Eh? And as we will see later on, eh? there is also a slow phenomenon that are extremely important for the implementation. Eh? such as the activation of catalyzers. You have a chemical reactor. Today, the chemical industry uses catalyzers for everything. Catalyzers are very expensive. Typical reactor can be maybe one million, two, three million euros, and so on. They last for two, three years, and so on, at most, and so on. And the, the activity of the catalyzer degrades, so the operation of the reactor degrades according to the way you operate. So you cannot avoid this if you wish to include the economics. Right? You have to include this long term effect. But many other things. In a furnace, right? you have the cooking effect. Right? Your pipes right, are covered by coke, right? and then the efficiency, the operation degrades, and you have to, after some time, you have to clean the clean also decreases the life of, of, the, of the furnace, and you stop the plant, so that means, means money, and so on. So these long-term effects are very important today. And then when you talk with the people of, of the big companies, and so on, this, eh, with the people planning, they said, no, okay, you have very nice RTO solutions, so, but you cannot apply this, because your solution don't take into account this degradation of the life, and this is very important for us for money. So you have to, to put into your problems this long, slow effects and so on, if you wish to go with this really to the current practice and so on. Of course, well, you can do it in two ways, either put here dynamics, or you can merge these two points with this. But this is only feasible for units and for more things. Normally, you have to go, if you wish to cover whole plant and so on, you have to go to this scheme and so on. Okay. Second point is the process model gap. Eh? You are going to take decisions with your model, and what you compute is the optimal of your model, not the optimal of the process. Eh? If you don't take into account the differences, maybe that you order such and some set points that they don't correspond to the reality. Okay. So there are different ways of dealing with this problem. One is what we have mentioned before. This is data reconciliation. So you update your model, you correct the parameters of your model, yeah, and you estimate values of the variables. This is okay, but it's well known for the theory that only for parametric, parametric uncertainty this will work. That means if your model has structural errors, eh, well, even if you adjust perfectly your model to your measurements, eh, the result with the optimization is not going to be the process optimum. It's going to be the model optimum. Okay. So this is, has, has, that's what happened. This is the, the current state of the art in industry, updating the model, but it's not... Eh, a perfect solution. Hmm? The other possibility is just to modify the optimization problem, but I'm going to comment this too. And another possibility for, for reducing this is to use self-optimizing, in the sense that you, you don't use the model, finally, you use a control structure. Hmm? And the, the other two alternatives currently in, in operation are, you have this optimization model, optimization problem and so on. And instead of solving this, you solve a modified optimization problem, which information for the plan, such that the solution of the modified optimization correspond to the real process optimum. And for that you need to include this extra term here. And this extra term depends of information that the the gradients depends on the gradients of the cost functions and the constraints of the process. You have to perform measurements in the process. This works very well. We have tested it, we have tested it many times. And, but the problem is that the size of the, of the application can be a process unit, but not maybe the whole plant. In the, today, 
the state of the art. So more research is, need, is needed in, in this problem. The other option uh, in order to reduce this problem is to include uh, stochastic variables. There are many variables that you don't know which uh, the, the, the value is unknown. And so, so finally you, made, you include some uh, uncertainty in different ways. Today the most promising approach is the two core multi-stage stochastic optimization or in practice two-stage stochastic optimization in which you reduce the typical uh, propagation of uncertainty into the future by assuming that uh, you now you don't know which is the weather uh, or, I don't know, or the demand of tomatoes for, uh, for the coming month but uh, so you have to take now uh, one decision without knowing this but one month later you will see which is the real demand you can adjust uh, you take your measurements and adjust to the reality so you use this future information in order to reduce the uncertainty in the future uh, uh, so you can adapt your decisions to the uncertainty in the future which is unknown and this reduces a lot the whole problem from that computational point of view. So, but also this is a huge eh, computational problem. And, so on. and the third element eh, that is on, uh, on the priorities of the research and so on, is linked to the implementation. So you solve your optimization problem, but then you have to translate. This is mathematics and this is numbers in a computer. You have to move this into the reality, into the control systems and so on. Poof. Okay. <laughs> Good. So I'm going to skip. So there are problems of implementation. I'm going to, just to illustrate these ideas, I'm going to talk a bit about a, a real problem. This is a, a vice course of fiber in, in Austria. We, have, we are working with, and, and this is a picture of one evaporator plant. And, so on. and well, this is like that, has uh, 11 evaporators. And so on. Uh, cooling tower and uh, heating system and so on and the process works more or less you have here you have one uh, juice and you wish to evaporate water from there right? it goes to uh, the juice goes here and then from this evaporator is recirculated through a third heat exchanges here it receives heat from the outside and here under low pressure well, this, uh, this is used to heat the, the heat exchanges and under low pressure you remove water and so on. Yeah. Okay, this is the process. And the, the idea is how to operate optimally the process in order to minimize the specific steam consumption. You need to evaporate a certain amount of water and you wish to spend as less steam as possible. Huh? Fresh steam from here. And can see, this is the this is the instrumentation of the plant. As you can see, there is no many meters. For instance, in all these evaporators, there is nothing, no single measurement, eh? and here and so on. So, if you wish to perform data reconciliation, you have to decrease. Don't try to model this, 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 and this. You have to group together things eh? and use aggregate models for this part because it's the only way to get enough measurements for, the, for your model and so on. And the main manipulated variables are the recirculating flow, the operating temperature here, the final, and the operation of the cooling tower and so on, basically. So, uh, first step is to perform data reconciliation. For data reconciliation, you need, uh, I'm going to skip this. For data reconciliation, you need a model. But how are you going to model this type of processes, of course? You have to include things that you know they are through, like mass balances, energy balances, and so on. But there are many other relations that need to be included, because it's clear that one model, in order to be used for prediction, has, to, has exactly the same degrees of freedom of the reality. So there are parts of the models that cannot be uh, model it because you have lamp you units and so on and relations between temperature concentration and pressure and so that maybe they are in, in the uh, thermodynamic databases and, and so on cannot be used because it's a mixture of, of things and so, on. so you have to to use data reconciliation and the methodology is basically you estimate 
all variables. And then you go, you perform data reconciliations on doing this. Eh? Well, it, normally you don't minimize this because this is a very bad function from the point of view of robustness. Eh? You have to use robust data reconciliation in which the functions that you minimize are not, are not square functions like this one, but functions that uh, limit the gross errors. They decrease. When you move away from the zero error, you decrease the weight automatically. And so on. This is just one detail. And, so on. and while you perform data reconciliation, and you estimate all variables. And then, and this is the, the result of the data reconciliation, you can see that you can discover bias in some of the measurements and so on. And, uh, but then, those part of the models, of the model that are not well known, that were not in the model, has to be extracted from this information that you get from data reconciliation. And you can discover patterns, like relations between the what, certain flows and, and certain uh, what, relation between certain flows. You go to the experimental data and you can yeah, say this is a linear relation, or relation, this is between the temperatures and concentrations, and you discover uh, some relations, and then you, once that you do this, you test it for a long period of time. Validation of models is key. But this is, for instance, eight months of operation in which uh, you are estimating the steam consumption in the plant. Uh, once that you are satisfied with this, say my model with this, I, my uh, hybrid model, Partly is knowledge base, partly is experimental data, and the combination of both, eh, you are satisfied you can go to the RTO. The RTO, you try to minimize something, for instance, the specific steam consumption, and so on, under a set of constraints, and you gray model. And you solve this. Eh, normally, in order to solve this problem, you need a special software good software for optimization. Of course, you can use GAMS and so but today there are better alternatives. Right? And for instance, uh, environments like Casadi offer you tools not only for simulation, but uh, for automatic uh, um, conversion with, uh, with uh, orthogonal collocation. Uh, you can perform automatically the computation of the derivative for the algorithms using automatic differentiation and so on. And good, the, today there are good algorithms, eh? interior point methods like IPOP and so on. And with this, you can solve the problems properly. Eh? This is just one result of you get with the optimization. So this is optimization. Eh? And you can see that typically you can gain eh? in the power consumption. You, uh, this is the reconcile and the optimize, so you, there is a cut, and you can get some improvements and so on. Okay, this is the you model and the results. Now, how to bring this solution into practice? Of course, you can repeat this, right? can be done, but you, have, you need to maintain the models. So there is a lot of things. From our point of view, this is not only a practice with this. Uh, with this case studies, something we have made in all places, and so on. The best policy is to study the structure of the solutions and then to try to move them into a control solution. Uh, so you study which is the structure. Uh, in this particular case, the optimum can be obtained when the temperature of the, of the juice in the recirculation is as high as possible. Uh, and the recirculation flow is as low as possible. This as low as possible depends, of course, of if you compute your model, your, your coefficients, and so on and so on. But if you try to put this as control solution, it's a real measurement. This is not, it doesn't matter if your model was not perfect. What you are applying, this is the reality, and so on. And in this case, we design a control structure like this, in which you, the operator said the, the well, that was designed, in fact, by the people of, of the plant eh? <laughs> in Lenthin. Eh? But uh, the evaporation rate is the, the, wish, the one that you wish. You estimate the one with the data reconciliation. You are estimating the real one. And this is a split range controller that tries to match The first branch goes to maximizing the temperature, but avoiding saturation with this valve position controller. So they, 
if the bulk gets saturated, then this is reduced, the temperature is reduced. So you are, you are operating at maximum compatible with, with control, with good control. And the second branch goes then in order to maintain the evaporation rate as high as possible according to this. Simple solution implemented in plant. This is the, the data for, is, this has been in operation for nearly one year or maybe more. No? And around 2.5% 2, 2 saving in the vapor. This is roughly around 3,000, uh, 30, sorry, 300,000 euros per year, which is not bad. Right? And the problem of this is that this is the solution for today. Okay, this is, you implemented the solution that correspond to operation that you obtain, right? this is a solution for today. But this not take into account, we don't know if this, the solution for today corresponds to the solution when you consider fouling in the evaporation. According to the way you, you operate, fouling is different. That means that after 15 days, after one month, you have to stop. And when you stop, you stop maybe for one day of cleaning and so on, the production stops at this point. Hmm? And you have to spend uh, chemicals, and so there are some costs. Huh? So you have to balance both things. That's what I mentioned before and so on. Huh? And if, when you uh, operate continuously, fouling increases, so you have to consume more steam. So if you delay cleaning, you are consuming more and more steam. If you stop, you have to spend time, uh, processing time, cost, and so on in cleaning. So there's a balance, a trade-off between those things. So the idea was to develop a model of fouling. And this is an experimental model, which you, using the data reconciliation for long periods of times, uh, then you are able to fit one model uh, into that. How the structure of this is obtained, I'm not going to enter, but there are software that is able to uh, deal with structural problems and as well. And this is, these are results, uh, these are different cleanings. Red is the model, the brown, the, the black is the, the estimated heat transfer coefficient. So, so this is a model of, of the following operation and so on. Then you need to include dynamics into the problem. The dynamics, the problem here is that this is not a question of some hours. Right? You have to include at least one month on the future in your optimization problem. And well, of course, you have a, a cost function here, right? and you try to minimize the operating cost and the cleaning cost over a whole cycle of operation. Right? But uh, basically, let's say the, the trick here is uh, as time moves ahead, you have to reduce the, the prediction horizon and so, but uh, maintaining uh, as, uh, a fixed number of decision intervals and so on, that typically correspond to one day or so. But uh, the problem is uh, around uh, 3,000 variables and so on, and can be solved in less than two minutes and so on. And, they, and this is the comparison between what you obtain with a static RTO and with, which you obtain with dynamic RTO. And here, these are the main manipulated variables. The operation temperature in the previous case was to maintain constant the temperature. If you include dynamics, say, no, this is okay at the beginning, but then you have to move away. This is in percent uh, of the some range. And, so on. and the same for the recirculating flow. So policies are different, and the, the optimal you get are different. And in fact, this is, for instance, the, the and red is the static solution, uh, and the dynamic gives different improvement. So you reduce in quite a lot, eh? the money the, per hour that you are saving and, and so on. Okay, but this is just the, the real measurement and, and the, the consumption. And now, third step, 
Eh? Because up to now we have been talking about only one evaporation plant. So, uh, but in this uh, factory we have 29 plants and we have nine products. And now operating optimally, this means not operating only one evaporation plant, but you have to operate the whole set. And there are different problems at this level. One is I have different products, nine products, I have 29 plants, and I have to process a certain amount. But uh, how much do I send to this plant, to this plant? Shall I send it this to this or here and there? And so this is clearly a scheduling problem. You have to schedule production and so And you enter into the upper level, upper decision levels and so And the Problems can be, the problem can be approached in, with different stages. And so. The first one is just to solve only the distribution, the static distribution problem. Right? Static distribution problem means that if I suppose that this has to be distributed in these three evaporators, all of them has different uh, fouling states, right? so different heat transfer coefficients, right? and you have to distribute the whole amount among the three, taking into account the steam consumption is different because the fouling state is different, the size is different, and so on, eh? so that you minimize the total energy cost and so on. And this is uh, something that, well, this is a typical optimization problem. I had, let me show you the one tool here that we have uh, developed for that. Um, looks like that eh? and here you have uh, products uh, here you have evaporators and so on and then you, you load uh, data from uh, data for a data reconciliation and so on you can optimize the distribution okay this is done so it's extremely fast because this is just a static problem and so on and then you wish to see the the detail and so on you can enter here and to see for every plant and so on, so how everything should operate and so on. Okay, so this is just to give you one idea of the type of tools that can operate online and so on. But uh, you can also consider not just the, op the operation at a time instant, but you can include the problem of the fouling and the uh, whole scheduling. So that means that you have here different uh, evaporators, eh? this is time, you have to decide to plan production in the sense that uh, you have to assign the different products to different units over time, this can change, for instance you can in this uh, period of time you can assign this product to this unit but then at the, uh, here is a cleaning section and then it can start with a different product and, and so on. And you have to solve the assignment of the different units and so taking into account fouling. I'm not going to enter into this problem because, of course, we have no time. <laughs> yes. Okay, no, I, I will skip all those things. There are different ways in which you can put this problem uh, in continuous, in discrete mode and so on. Yeah, you just, but the, what you are looking for is a GAN diagram hmm, in which you know for every evaporator when it's working, when when it has to be clean, when it's in either situation and so on. And of course you are going to apply only the solution of the first day. But the important point is that toward the future you have feasible solutions. So you are not doing something today that avoids you eh, to operate properly in the future. So this is the, the and what well, this is uh, represented in different ways, just to say that this is one solution, for instance, obtained for nine evaporators in one month of operation. This is the scheduling. And that the problem we are dealing now is just how to include now uncertainty into the scheduling and so on at the same time. And it's in uncertainty because of the weather. Cooling towers don't operate the same way when it's hot or it's, it's raining or not, and, and so on. So, and the production also uh, 
can change over time. You, we just don't know exactly which is the scheduling. And you can formulate eh, with stochastic optimization the same scheduling problem that involve normally scheduling involve integer and, 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 lean, and real variables and so on. And this is the result for one evaporator. Eh? You take this, this decision now and this is what you will do in the future according to the uncertainty that you have with the weather and production. So if something happens in this day, you will do this. If not, you do this. And you, but you guarantee that for all these scenarios, you have feasible solution if you do this today. And this will maximize the, the production there. So I will skip also the conclusion. Sorry for the tough. It's too, too large. Thank okay. you.